at the heart of the economic and cultural and social um, growth that we're going to be seeing in Wales over the next um, few years. And I think the scale of the ambition and the ideas you're going to be hearing, um, I think, are going to come out from every session. Um, and I think that reflect, is reflected in the, just the wide range of supporters um, and sponsors that, that uh, we have for this event. And uh, you can go to the website, I think, to check out the full range of activities going on. I'll keep you in touch with those that, that, uh, that's happening over the next few days. Uh, my name is Michael Gubbins. Uh, I'm the chair of Film Cymru uh, Wales, uh, formerly the film agency for Wales, um, with a kind of lead agency for film in the country. Um, and I'm going to be hosting the different panels over the next two days. But I'd like to, to kick the event off, uh, if possible. And again, I think it demonstrates how important this is seen within Wales uh, by introducing a couple of speakers just to um, introduce the event. So uh, beginning with Phil Bale, the uh, leader of Cardiff City Council. Phil. Thank you, Alex. Well, Boradar, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for coming today. I think it's incredibly important that we've got an event like this in the city. Uh, last year, it was uh, Digital Cardiff. This, this, uh, this uh, year, we're talking about uh, Wales, and I, I think uh, we may well be heading for Europe or the world uh, at the rapid rate in which uh, the digital and creative industries in the city are growing. So it's an exciting, very exciting time, and as many of you will also know, uh, Cardiff is one of the, if not one of, the largest uh, centres for creative industries outside of London. So there's a real buzz at the moment in terms of what's going on here, uh, and none more so than with the announcement a couple of weeks ago that the BBC, BBC Cymru Wales, will be relocating their corporate headquarters to Central Square in a, an absolutely stunning um, Norman Foster design building. Uh, and, and I'm very pleased to say that our development part partner, Right Takers, is already seeing uh, a very significant increase in inquiries as a result of that. Uh, and we are expecting uh, a, a new creative hub to emerge in the city centre as a result uh, of that announcement. As well as that, we've got the, the drama village at Porth Tiger that the BBC have invested consider considerably in, uh, and the Pinewood Studios decision uh, that we'll see uh, a new production facility in, in Cardiff Bay as well. So these are really, really exciting uh, times. As well as uh, the importance of jobs and growth in the city, I also think it's very important uh, to recognise, and I, I notice in the programme you've got uh, a session on open data and some of the work Leeds City Council are doing. It is really important for the council and for citizens uh, to, to benefit and to connect as much as, uh, as uh, employers in the creative industries. And I think uh, increasingly we can see that with San Francisco uh, cities that are really uh, embracing app technology, using citizen engagement in a way that uh, can create some really innovative ideas in terms of uh, public service delivery going forward. And that's something I'm really keen to see developed and enhanced in Cardiff as well. Uh, next week, we'll be launching a new social ent uh, innovation fund uh, in, the, in the city, and I, I really would encourage you to, uh, to uh, learn and find out more about that, because I think it's a very good opportunity for us to support startup social enterprises uh, to address some of the social, environmental, and economic challenges that a fast-growing city like Cardiff uh, will face going, uh, going forward. And uh, as I say, details on that will, will be announced uh, in due course. As well as being our nation's capital, Cardiff uh, also acts as a connecting point to the rest of, of Wales, to the world. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, um, it's really important that we build on some of those uh, announcements that we've seen, uh, particularly the new internet exchange that the city uh, announced uh, several weeks ago. Uh, and that's going to be built in the heart of our enterprise zone in the city centre. Uh, we'll be offering grants of up to £20,000 to small and medium-sized enterprises uh, to connect to that inter internet exchange, and it's part of a £600,000 uh, investment that the, the council will be making there, so um, some significant sums involved. In addition to that, we also will be continuing our connection voucher scheme, and that involves small and medium-sized enterprises to apply for grants of up to £3,000 to get connected uh, to uh, improve their super-vast capability. Uh, and actually, that's a part of an even bigger scheme, an £8.6 million investment that the City Council is making to improve connectivity in the city. 
if we if we look at Cardiff as a city, I think it's really important that we don't just look at the infrastructure, that we actually look at uh, uh, how we connect Cardiff uh, to the rest of the world. And I think uh, one of the things that I'll be looking to do uh, over the, the coming months and years, really, is to showcase the very best of Welsh talent uh, internationally, as well as making sure that we attract uh, some of that talent here to, to Wales and to Cardiff as well. And that's why uh, it's encouraging to see some speakers uh, from some really big name brands like Microsoft and Twitter here today uh, uh, really working alongside uh, some high quality names that are already here in the city, uh, Espedwerek and uh, BBC Cymru Wells, of course, um, some of those as well. Uh, I hope very much that you enjoy uh, today and uh, indeed the events over the next week. Uh, and uh, very much look forward to uh, seeing how the event grows over the years ahead. Thank you very much. Dioch. Okay, for our next speaker, um, just so you know, if you've got your headphones, um, because uh, you'll need it for Welsh translation if you're not a Welsh speaker, uh, we've got Ian Jones. We share an office. Uh, we'll very quick share an office with S4C um, and uh, the innovation that I think is coming out of S4C has been extraordinary over the last few years and uh, well, uh, introducing this event also we've now got Ian Jones the Chief Executive Officer S4C. Um, I thought I'd try and confuse everybody to start with so I'm going to be talking in Welsh but at certain points, I'm going to dip into English. So exercise on a Monday morning. Headphones off, headphones on. Headphones off, headphones on. But I won't tell you when. My Gair um, Arloisi, seen in Vangos and the title and title of Uthnos and Man Gair Divoro. My Arloisi and Boisig Mown in Rio de Widiant, my Gradio. On to where the Marini grew, ear my summer, e my sticky to. On beth, bethening go luggy, orth arloisi. Cachwin a daith, your sunyad. Ach maraitro sunyad and now we didn't know you, name was saneth, she then dig on in a grew, a guy in a grew, e great worth. On do her knee wife the Mundigon. When Hyde wed in Persuad your Cusmer, Idalia Macanirch, Canirch Guerthfowl, Sid Weddy Grey. On do our loisy are he in wife the Mundigon. When Hyde Diash wed in, Sid Droid Sunia Dana, and Rubeth a Werth, when Hyde Diash with young Henny on of Archnad, with my Cusmer Isha, with my Canisha Idva. Isha. Right, I'm going to piss a lot of people off now, but anybody can get an idea. Anybody can get an idea. There's a lot of rubbishy ideas around, and not a lot of people get good ideas. But understanding what the customer wants is important. You can have the best idea in the world, but it won't succeed unless you know what people want. And that's the value in innovation. A dwi'n falch iawn, felly, wel y sesiynau heddiw yn edrych ar y gynulleid fang Hymru a thi hwnt. Sesiynau eraill yn edrych ar sut i ddefnyddio data, a mae data yn ei fod yn holl bwysig o, o fynd i'r dyfodol. Defnyddio'r data i gael dialltwriaeth eto o anghenion y cwsmer, a sut mae creu cynnwys newydd ar sail yr anghenion hynny. Fedrai ddim pwysleisio digon bod ar loisi yn golygu dim byd, heb y wybodaeth yma i gyd. Ac wrth gwrs y gallu i weld ac i adnabod cyfleoedd yn y lle cyntaf. I fi felly, mae yna tri pwrpas i'r wythnos hon. Y cyntaf, y gair yn y cyfle. Creu cyfleoedd, cyfleoedd i gwmniau ac i unigolion i ddatblygu'r ffordd maen nhw'n gweithredu yn maes digido. Yr ail pwrpas, creu cyfleoedd i bobl o, o wahanol ddisgyblaethau, maen nhw'n gymysgwch yma, roedd nhw'n yma, lot o ddisgyblaethau, a dod y pawb at i gilydd i gydweithio. 
a thrwy wneud hynny, dwi'n trydydd pwrt bas i fi. Casglu'r gwybodaeth yna, fel bod ni gyd yn gallu cydweithio i droi'r syniadau fel wedi si o'r blaen yn rhywbeth o, o werth. Os mae gynnau ni siawns, os mae gynnau ni siawns enfaf ar hyn o bryd, i greu diwydiant creadigol newydd yng Nghymru, sydd adigidol yn rhan greuddiol o'i DNA. Mae yna potensiol unigryw. Ac mae gennym gynnau ni USP unigryw, y mysg gwleidydd prydain, sydd y gallu weithio'n ddwy eithog. A chreu cynnyrch aml ieithyddol ar gyfer farchnad rhyngwladol, sy'n lot o bleidydd yn gallu wneud hynny. I ni'n gallu wneud hynny. Mewn cyfweliad tri blynyddodd yn ôl, um, nath newydd i'r dirwr cynnig sylw i'r enwog Steve Jobs, cyn pennaeth Apple. A wedodd y newydd i'r dirwr, hwn oedd y men nhw i fe, um, fod Apple yn lwcus. Rwy'n nhw'n dda yn arloesu. Ond dwi'n nhw lot mwy lwcus nag eraill, oherwydd fod ganddynt lot o arian. A lot o arian i wireddu'r syniadau. Ond a'i droi'r Saesneg i, i roi ateb Steve Jobs. What Steve Jobs said was, innovation has nothing at all to do with how much money you have. It's not about money, it's about people. And how much you and they get it. Mae'n adoreth o, o dalent yng Nghymru ac dwi'n gobeithio bydd gweithgareddau'r wrth nos yma yn darparu'r gwybodaeth angen reidiol hynny a bod pawb yma yn, yn cymryd mantes o fod yma a chymryd mantes o, o'r cyfleoedd cyffroes newydd sydd yn maes digido. Fel, fel bod chi gyd yn casglu'r gwybodaeth angen reidiol yna ac yn geiriau Steve Jobs, in Steve Jobs' word, by the end of the week, we all get it. Mwyn hewch yr wythnos. Okay, uh, well, thanks very much for those introductions. Um, let me just give you, uh, I'm aware of the time then, but let me give you a very, very brief introductory thought um, before we start the day. Um, we, uh, this, this, my, my, one of my favorite things, I was uh, the editor of um, a magazine covering business technology right in the middle of the dot-com period, and uh, there was a great uh, company called Gartner, which does consultancy for all of these giant companies right at those early stages, and they invented something called the hype curve, and the hype curve, I think, is something which absolutely explains the way that most of us um, as businesses and as, as people involved with the internet have tended to think. You start off with something happening, a technology trigger somewhere. You then get hugely overexcited about what it's going to do and how it's going to change everything. And then it reaches a peak of what they call a peak of inflated expectation, uh, where all of the dreams that you had put onto this technology haven't really happened. And then it crashes down because everyone thinks, oh, it doesn't work. And then it goes down to this trough of disillusionment where we all think, you know what, it's, this stuff doesn't work. And then slowly, um, it reaches its proper level. Now, that first bit of the height curve is where we tend to have conferences when we're overexcited or when we're too depressed. Um, and I think the film industry is really bad at this. Um, but last, year I was in, uh, last week I was in Barcelona at a film industry conference where they were saying all of this digital technology stuff, it, it doesn't really, it's, people just don't like it, it doesn't work. He was saying that as uh, in the evening as we were repeating, as we were watching the World Cup on an iPhone while simultaneously tweeting with people from Uruguay um, and actually taking part in some quiz over the internet. So the bit that makes it work, and that's where the focus of all of this conference is going to be, is people. It's the bit where people interact and intersect with uh, digital that makes all the difference which is why I think this conference and this discussion over the next few weeks is all going to be about the way that people and technology have come together to create new potential, 
And that's really where I think um, we want the conversation to be, not in our over-expectation, not in our misery, not in all that disruption, but in the realities of what can be achieved when you bring together people in innovation. So that's my very uh, two-minute introduction from myself. So first of all, let's have one more um, uh, applause for the uh, speakers here. And then... Uh, and then uh, just one last thing before I uh, let them go from the stage. This is an interactive discussion. So if you look up here, oh, it's gone. You'll see the uh, Twitter. It'll come up in a moment. There's a Twitter hashtag that um, you can contribute to. Uh, there it is. I'm going to see the questions in front of me here. So um, as you're talking and as you're, um, as you're interacting with each other, feel free to stick up some tweets. Um, and we'll try and make that part of the discussion, as well as the questions that will come from microphones on the floor. So um, thanks to speakers. And uh, as I was saying, that interaction between people and uh, digital is the, uh, the perfect, I think, introduction to our first speaker, uh, Dave Coplin of uh, Microsoft. Uh, it's got a great title, Chief Envisioning Officer. I want that title. Um, and he's going to come and talk. He's, he's written this, this uh, great uh, piece of work to get, get a chance to read called Rise of the Humans. Um, but I think a lot of his work is exactly about that point. So, Dave. So while we're waiting for that to come up, uh, I need to explain. So I'm Dave Coppin from Microsoft. Um, I need you to understand I have a comedy job title. Right? So I am Microsoft UK's Chief Visioning Office. Let me out. It's important. The job titles are important. You know job titles are important because I work for a company that loves to talk to you all about the technology and products that we make. What we don't do enough is talk about the human beings that use them. So my job is to project out to the future, to think about the future of how human beings are going to want to live work. to be a force for good in our society. It's supposed to be this thing that enables human beings to rise up and achieve more than they could do on their own. My problem is, after 20 years in IT, I look around at how we all use technology, and I don't see a release. I see a prison. I see something that constrains how we think, constrains how we work, controls what we do. And I refuse to accept that as our future. So last year, I wrote a book called Business Reimagine, and that was a book about the future of work. Because my theory is the way we work today actually is all wrong because it's based on how we used to work in the past. It's not based on the gift that technology gives us every single day. And it's based on this simple principle. So if you could just humor me, could you put your hand up if you have a computer at home? Excellent. Could you keep your hand up if the computer you have at home is better than the one you have at work? It's the majority of people, right? I ask this question to every single audience I speak to. I love doing it, especially if there are public sector representatives in the audience. It's kind of like shooting fish in a barrel at that point. But the reality is, right, we live in these incredible times. We have grandparents Skyping grandkids. You live online, you shop online, you play online, you communicate, you collaborate. You have this fantastic personal experience with technology, and then you go to work. And this is how most people feel when they go to work. They're greeted by some long-haired, beardy git like me in IT who just likes to say, no, you can't do that. No, no, I'm sorry. 
And I just, you know, I've spent the majority of my career chasing people down corridors like some bizarre freakish stalker, just trying to get them to care about what technology might do for them. These days, thanks to your personal experience with technology, that chase still happens. It's just it's the other way around. You guys chase me. Why can't I do this stuff? This should be a great time for us, but instead it's a challenging time. So we did some more work about the future of work. With just the, This is a video we did with the RSA. If you want to get a real understanding of business reimagined, if you go to this link, it's one of those lovely sort of animations. But the story was essentially this. We live in a world where the, the, the problem we have is about engagement. Employees are fundamentally disengaged with, how, with who they work for and what they do. And the challenge there, we saw a study in the US that showed on average 71% of the North American workforce is disengaged at work, not really that bothered about what they do. And without making any kind of moral judgment about whether it's better to live to work or work to live, the reality is given how long we will spend at work in our working lives, the thought of not being engaged terrifies me. But then it also doesn't take a genius to figure out the correlation between disengaged employees and your customers. And the trick here is to understand that we've got to figure out the engagement problem. But the engagement problem goes back to one of the real, real challenges that we face. And it's actually our definition of productivity. The way we think about productivity in organizations today is actually the problem. Because we think about productivity in terms of the Industrial Revolution, where what we did is we stopped worrying about the end result of the products and services that we made. And we broke them down into individual standardized services. So let's say I'm, an, I'm a car manufacturer, right? I work for a car manufacturer. I no longer care about how good the car is because you're paying me to make widgets. And why this is the gesture for making widgets, I don't know. It kind of feels like it should be. Making widgets, pulling points, it's all the same. But the point is, you've separated me from the outcome because you're paying my bonus on how good the widgets are. I couldn't give a stuff whether the car's any good because I make the best damn widgets this company's ever seen. But more importantly, by creating these rigid, standardized interlinked processes, you create this sclerotic infrastructure, this uh, infrastructure skeleton that will resist change. So if your market changes, if you need to stop making cars and start making airplanes, you can't. You have to disassemble your entire organization. This is how our current definition of productivity constrains us. And then there's the place of work. Most of us work in open plan offices, and open plan offices were genius in the 50s and 60s in the west coast of the US. If you wanted to get people to collaborate, the only choice you had would be to shove them all in the middle of the same physical space, and they would talk to each other. How many of you sit in your open plan office emailing the person sat next to you? What time are we going for lunch? I don't know. Where are we going to go? I don't know. Technology increasingly is becoming a barrier to how we communicate. But also, the challenge that we have is if we want to be creative, we cannot be creative in a busy, noisy, chaotic environment. Shoving us in the middle of the floor in a noisy, open plan office is not the space for us to be creative. But fundamentally, where we netted out after the first book was this place, where it doesn't matter how you think about work. The reality is the real challenge about how we get anything from technology is all down to what my dad calls the interface between the keyboard and the chair. It's us. It's human beings. and to explore the opportunity. And that's where the second book comes. I should say that I'm a cheap date. So all of the books are available for free. If you have a Kindle, you can get them on Amazon. If you don't have a Kindle, let me know, and I can send you a download link. Because the books are meant to open people's eyes to the potential of what technology can bring. And the story I really want to tell you today is the story of the second book, The Rise of the Humans. And it starts in this place called the Digital Deluge. And we're familiar with this, right? We walk around all the time telling, oh, man, we've just got too much information. There is so much information out there. There is too much information. But the Deluge actually has a second dimension, a second dimension that makes it even more problematic. And it's the dimension that's brought by these things, these beautiful, engaging, powerful, lovely mobile devices that we carry with us wherever we go. Because now we have access to too much information wherever we go, whatever we're doing. From the minute we wake up to the minute we go to bed, we are smothered. We are covered in too much information. And it leads to a place that most of you will be familiar, which is this. And just to illustrate the point, who doesn't get enough email? Right? I don't even have to invent a punchline to that joke. We all know the pain of what that means. But again, that shouldn't be where we are. But we need to understand how we got there. And I'm a big believer that we can learn a lot about the future from looking at our past. And it's at this point, I'd like to lay all of the blame, all of the blame for our current problems with tech. And that individual is Alexander Graham Bell. Because back in 1876, he had a vision. He had an invention. 
He took us from a world of machine to machine translation, machine to machine communication, where in the old days, in 1875, if you wanted to communicate across a geographical distance, the only choice you had would be to engage into machine machine communication. You had a human being who would transcribe a message into a series of dots and dashes that then get shoved down a length of copper wire to another machine and another human being. What Alexander Graham Bell managed to do was to turn that into a uniquely human experience. So now I could engage in something that was really natural, normal, connecting people over vast geographical distances. But the problem is we didn't stop there. And now we live in this incredible world where I can stand pretty much anywhere on this earth and I can pick up this device and I can phone anyone else. How wonderful that is. But something interesting is happening. As well as technology being able to connect us when we're separated by geographical distance, increasingly it's disconnecting us when we aren't separated by geographical distance, when we're in the same bloody room. And this is our challenge. Because it's happening at work. We talked about this. We talked about the challenge of technology getting in the way. We hide behind our screens. We stick earphones on. We don't talk anymore. We just email each other, even though we're sat next to each other. It's happening at home. Those of you with kids will be familiar with this picture. Let me tell you, family time in the Copeland household is a bit like this. We will sit down and we'll say, do you know what? Wouldn't it be nice just for tonight? Let's all sit down at the table for dinner. It'd be really lovely. It's a family. It's a real good time. So I will sit down. My son will sit down. My wife will sit down. I get out my work phone. My son gets out his <coughs> nameless tablet device. Think about it. Wife gets out her phone. We sit there on our own bloody digital worlds. Nobody's talking anymore. We're just sitting there looking at the screens. We sit watching the TV, a shared experience. No one's sharing any experience because we're sat there looking at our devices, looking to the TV, looking to our devices. Nobody talks. Technology is getting in the way of how we communicate because we're not using it properly. It's happening in real life. How many times have you been to a concert or some big public event, New Year's Eve, wherever it may be, only to watch hundreds, if not thousands, of people enjoy the event from four inches behind a glowing rectangle. What's that all about? I asked the bloke, I went to a bloke, what, what are you doing? It's all right. I've got an HD camera on my phone. Yeah, right. I said, so have I. It's called my eyes. You know? Technology's getting in the way. But what we have to remember is that we're haven't evolved our etiquette to understand how to use the technology properly. So what we've done instead is we've developed a series of coping mechanisms that we think help, but actually are causing us lots and lots of problems. The first coping mechanism is this thing called skimming, because what we tend to do these days is surf across the surface of the water. We never dive deep. We skim across all the time, just looking for more information. You will have had this asked of you, or you will ask your people to do this. Don't send me a long email. Summarize it into three or four bullets. That's all I've got time to read. <coughs> you will ask search engines to go and find the paragraph from the book that you wanted to, to find out about. You lose the context of the book. You haven't been on the journey that the author's been. You just have that snapshot. This constant skimming is what we do with, with a coping mechanism we feel hopes, helps to cope with the sheer volume. But it's supported by another coping mechanism, which is snacking. And again, this is where these devices come in, because we now fill in every available nook and cranny of time with a little sneaky peek at our phones. Because wouldn't it be, I'll oh, just find some more information. But what we have to understand is that that's changing our, our, our relationship with the world around us. I'll give you a personal example. I like to put my son to bed at night. And there's this little window of time between when he's in his pajamas and when he's in bed waiting for his story. And in that little window, he's off cleaning his teeth. And I am completely redundant in the proceedings. So what do I do? I do what any good working dad would do. I say, I know what is in there. I just have a quick look. Quick look at me email, see what's going on at work. Oblivious to the fact that the minute I do that, I am now lo no longer mentally at home. Mentally, I am back at work. Now, best case, he comes back. Or those colleagues, do you know those emails you get that just send you in a froth of rage? And at that point, he can forget his bloody story because I'm off downstairs right now. I'm going to fix this. And the point is... I just never made that decision. When I pulled out my phone to snack on information, I was oblivious to what might happen. I was just filling in time. And what we need to do is to make much better choices about when the tech... There are times when you need to do that, but there are many times when you should leave the technology alone and be engaged in the moment that you're, that you're in. The third filter, the third mechanism is called filters. And these are the search engines, the recommendation engines that we use every day. And these are crucial because they help us separate the useful from the useless. 
But the challenge with filters is increasingly they're becoming smart, and they're starting to only show us the information they think we're interested in. Now, that's genius on one level and is really helpful in a world of too much information. Having someone anticipate the stuff you would like is brilliant, but it comes with a price. Because if all you ever see is things that the algorithms think you like, how do you ever find stuff you don't know you like? How do you discover new things? How do you encounter serendipity in a world that is always predicted? You don't. And so the challenge with filters is, yes, they're powerful, and yes, they're important, but we need to make choices about when we should use them and when we shouldn't. But my favorite of all of the coping mechanisms, because it's the worst, is the lie of multitasking. We are told to be successful as a 21st century citizen, somebody who lives and works in the 21st century, I have to, even as a male of the species, I must multitask. The thing is, what we've forgotten is multitasking is an entirely computer-based concept. It was invented in the mid-60s by a bunch of computer scientists in white lab coats who wanted to get central processing units to become more efficient. We've then adopted it as human beings, forgetting the fact that we cannot multitask. The brain is not built to multitask. Our studies and others that we've seen that on a similar topic show that on average, average human being, male or female, makes no difference, is a third less efficient when they multitask. But it gets worse. Because every time you get distracted from the task that you're doing, it takes you a long period of time to get back to where you were. We ran a series of experiments on our own people, because we're like that. And what we found is that there's actually a really interesting chemical process that goes on in the brain. The brain will reward anything you do that the body feels will contribute, the brain feels will contribute towards your future survival with a little hit of a hormone called dopamine. It's the brain's reward mechanism and it's the thing that keeps you alive. And what we found in our studies is that actually you would rather acquire more information than sit and think thoughtfully about the work that you have to do. And every time you acquire more information, you get a little hit of dopamine. And over time, this behavior pattern becomes reinforced. So basically, you would rather read another email, look at another tweet, click on another link, than actually take a minute to step and think about what you're actually doing. And this plays into multitasking. Back to our study of, of our people, we found that people were doing heavy-duty software, really um, cognitive work, coding. And they would get uh, distracted. And what would happen, because that little dopamine thing, Rather than going straight back to what they were doing once they'd finished the distraction, they would meander their way back. They would just, before I go to do that, I'm going to see what, see what my email's doing. See what's happening on Twitter. See what the footy scores are. The average time from the completion of the distraction to getting back to the work you were doing is 23 minutes. Again, male or female, it doesn't matter. So now you have a thing that is supposed to be saving our corporate lives, so it's supposed to be saving our working lives, excuse me. And it's a third less efficient, and every time we're distracted, there is a long period of time before we get back to what we're doing. How long do we need to go before we realize this is a behavior, this is a culture that we have to change? But all of these things come together to a really dangerous place, because thanks to the way that dopamine is shaping the way that we're thinking, thanks to the fact that we snack and binge and graze on information wherever we go thanks to these devices, we're losing the ability to think deeply. We're losing the ability to consider the context of the information that we show. We're running around consuming information without really understanding what it's doing for us. But the reality is, whilst I can paint a really bleak picture, it's actually good news. All it is that we've got to see it for an opportunity rather than a problem. And if you think that I think our future belongs to data, belongs to our better use of information, I think I will be more successful as an individual, I think the company I work for will be more successful, the better it uses data, we're essentially running around complaining having too much of the very thing that's going to deliver that future success. That's like me walking around complaining I've got too much money or too much chicken tikka. Frankly, two things in my life I'm never going to have enough of. We've got to stop learning to hate. We've got to start learning to harness this deluge rather than hate it. We've got to turn it around. And there are some ways that we can do that. The first way is about how we think about our customers. Most organizations, they see their customers in a single dimension. They see them in the dimension of the single transaction they're about to enact. When I walk into your shop, when I turn up at your website, why is Dave here? Oh, he's here to buy a TV. He's here to buy a service. Right, let's give him that service. Some organizations think about a second dimension. Amazon's a good example. Welcome back, Dave. I see you've bought books on Batman. Would you like books on Spider-Man? Genius at one level. But it's the third and fourth dimensions that are becoming really, really interesting and more accessible to us. The third dimension is to understand me as a holistic whole human being. Last year, the government did a really interesting study on the future of identity. And within that study was a little nugget that said, on average, 
we will all exhibit between 10 and 12 different personalities every single day. Now, we're not running around with multiple personality disorder. We just have different affinities that we choose to surface at different points. So I stand in front of you, not just Dave the Microsoft employee. I'm Dave the dad. I'm Dave the motorcyclist. I'm Dave the ice hockey fan. All of these things are me. You, know? you better figure out which one of those is the primary persona. When I click on your website, when I turn up in your shop, you better understand which one of those it is. Otherwise, your service you give me is going to be irrelevant. Let me use Amazon to give you an example, not because Amazon are bad, but it's an experience that we've probably all shared. Once a year, I will turn up to Amazon to buy my son's birthday present. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Get him some Lego. Happy boy. Why is it for the next two weeks, whenever I turn up at Amazon again, the only thing Amazon wants to show me is more bloody Lego? What's that all about? I mean, you should know that it was my son's birthday. You know that it's another few months till Christmas, and it's another year till his birthday. Stop showing me bloody Lego. Start showing me something that is for the persona that I'm using. Dave, the business person. Business books. That would be great. But increasingly, the data is becoming available for you all to look out and understand your customers in this way. And it's being provided by the fourth dimension, which is a social dimension. The social dimension works on two levels. The first level is the ability of your customers to really enact with your brand through social. And this is a good thing and a bad thing. Social customers are incredibly powerful these days. But the second dimension is actually if you understand the relationship of people to each other, you can do very interesting things with those services. With our search engine Bing in the US, with your permission, we will link your search results to your Facebook. So when you're making a purchase decision, somewhere to go for lunch, a bike to buy, or whatever it may be, you can see which of your friends have liked the results that you get. Now, this is important and useful. And I'll give you an example, a real-life example. So we had a service running in the UK for a few weeks while we were testing it. And, and my office is in London. And I'm walking down Victoria Street, which is by my office. And uh, I'm using my, it's lunchtime, using my phone to, to look for where I'm going to eat for lunch. So I'm typing in sushi because Bing's a good search engine. It tells me the 10 nearest restaurants. Now, because it has this feature, it's socially connected, it also tells me restaurant number two has been liked by this guy called Simon, who's one of my Facebook friends. Now, Simon, unlike the rest of my Facebook friends, is a real friend. Right? He's not a fake friend. He's actually, I grew up, he's my best mate from school. And the thing is, I know a lot about Simon because he's a real friend. I know that he and I grew up in the East Midlands in England. Uh, we, we went to school there. The thing I know about him is he never left the East Midlands. He's still there to this day. Never left, never traveled. So here's a guy who the only thing who know, he knows about raw dead fish is when it's battered and deep fried, recommending a sushi restaurant to me in London. As a basis of that recommendation and my knowledge of that individual, I am never, ever going to that restaurant. It's going to be crap, right? What does he bloody know? Right? Negative example, but you get my point. If you understand the relationship of people, you can actually do some really interesting things with the services you provide. So our theory is that the deluge is providing you with all of this information. It gives you the ability to tap into this information. If only you can open your eyes to connect it and learn from it. In order to do that, you want to think very differently about the people that you work with. And the people that you work with and the way you think about the people who work for your companies. So we've got to connect them. We've got to enable them in the same way that social media has enabled people to have a very different relationship with their government, with brands. The same is true with how you should work inside your organization. We need to completely change the culture of collaboration inside organizations. We need to unbox the inbox. Too much of information is locked into organizational silos, even if it's your own bloody inbox. What we need to do is to open that up the same way that we use the internet. The information is out there. You just have to look for it and find it. And when you think about information in those terms, you create a much more agile and engaged workforce. But all of this really is a story about data. And the challenge with data is that we think very lowly of data. We think very humbly of data. And the problem is data is absolutely huge. Most organizations think about data. Some will even go further and they'll talk about big data. But then they'll talk about business analysis or business insight. The point about data is data is the thing. It's, gonna, it's, it's the thing that's going to, people talk about it in terms of being the new oil, the thing that's going to drive a lot of revenue for your organizations, either through better services or through completely new services. There are three areas I'd like you to think differently about the data that you access and the data that you probably have. Most organizations already acquire lots of data as a byproduct of doing their job. The thing is, don't just look at that data to see what that data can do in terms of more insight about understanding your customers. Look at that data to see what, what could you do if you sold that data. Is there another organization that would buy that data from you? Could you sell it? There are many examples of where that's the case. The second thing is, what happens when you take the data you have and you connect it 
to other disparate, seemingly random data sets, you can create new insight and innovation. The insurance industry knows this. They know if they can understand the consu your consumer spending behavior, they can be a lot more insightful about the level of risk you place them as a customer. They know, for example, if you're the certain per sort of person that buys those little felt discs to put on your furniture to stop scratching your lovely wooden floors, you're several times more likely to make your payments than someone who doesn't. Who knew? Insurance industry does, because they started to connect disparate bits of data together. And the third way to think about data is actually, if you're going to generate new data as part of a business process, think about multiple uses for that data. If you're going to put, for example, CCTV into your retail stores, don't just look for shoplifters. Look for foot flow through the store. Have multiple uses for that data. But data is simply a fuel. And data is the preamble to this incredible world that we're moving into, which is a world of algorithms, a world of machine learning. Now, machine learning is this thing how it, that creates algorithms. It's basically statistical-based pattern recognition. And it is going to change, fundamentally change, our relationship with technology. It also is going to fundamentally change the way we live every single day. Let me give you some examples. This is my favorite example because it's only a few weeks old. About four weeks ago, we Microsoft demonstrated via Skype. So we had a gentleman speaking German, lady speaking English, gentleman speaks German, lady hears English, lady speaks English, gentleman hears German, real time. By the end of this calendar year, there will be trials available for you all to use for Skype, where basically you click on a drop-down box and say, well, what language would you like to speak? We already have a Welsh translator. So based on this kind of technology, which is powered by machine learning, let me be provocative, I have an eight-year-old son. Do I bother to get my eight-year-old son to learn to speak another language? Now, I get that's provocative and maybe a bit extreme, but this is the kind of potential that these new technologies are going to drive. They're going to change our world fundamentally all through this thing in machine learning. And as you play it out, you end up in another sort of dystopian view, a world where the robots do all the heavy lifting, the algorithms take over, don't have to do anything, and actually no longer are the human beings required. Well, I don't buy that, right? Because the whole point of technology for centuries has been to lift the capability of human beings. And as much as I'll tell you that the future belongs to machine learning, it's also limited by machine learning as well. And we have to understand the way the machine learning uh, works actually provides certain limitations. This is an example of, of both the power and, and the limitation of machine learning. This is from an email that did the rounds in about 2003, which is based on some proper academic research that showed in English, as long as you take the first character and the last character and you keep them in the same place of a word, you can mix up the rest of the letters and pretty much everybody can make sense of what's being said there. Does everybody sort of feel that you can make sense of that? What do you think? Forming his language skills. Can't make sense of it. And the reason it happens is in the back of the mind, you have a pattern of data, you have a pattern of language. Right? You've spent your lives building that pattern. So when you look at something like this, that pattern kicks in and it starts to reassemble the words for you. It puts all of the letters back in the right place. But if you don't have that pattern, you cannot do it. This is the limitation of the, of the algorithms because they're only as good as the patterns that they're powered by. So let me give you an example. IBM has two lovely supercomputers. One's called Watson, the other one's called Big Blue. Watson is the world's best Jeopardy player. So Jeopardy is a US uh, quiz show. And uh, Big Blue is the world's best chess player. These are supercomputers. But the limitation they have is they've only been provided with the pattern for those games. So yes, they are supercomputer. Billions of dollars have been spent on them. They are enormous, completely powerful, just incredible machines. I could beat both of them with one ambit tight to be me back at a game of Snap or Tiddlywinks because they haven't got the pattern for that. So this is where human beings need to come in. We need to provide the patterns for that and make the connection. So what does this really mean for you? There are some things I want you to walk away with, things I want you to understand. So number one, if you want to deliver transformational experiences to your customers, you need two things. You need employees or people in your team who are empowered to be transformational. It's no use trying it without that. And secondly, they need access to tools that enable them to be transformational. You need to work, move away from a world of organizations and into a world of intelligent organisms. Organisms are different because they evolve, they change, they're malleable, they bend. They can react to changes in the market. They can react to new opportunities provided by your staff. In order to do that, you've got to think really differently about the people that work for you. 
Most organizations think about their individuals just in the, in the context of their job description. The only thing I'm interested in day four is what he does every day. Well, hang on a minute. There's a whole bunch of other stuff I bring with me every time I walk through the door. All my past experiences, that bizarre, weird stuff I do on weekends. It's all got value to you if you can just open yourself up to understand what that might be. So thinking very differently about your workforce is, is really important. But fundamentally, what you've also got to do is to go create a data culture. You're going to hear lots today about the power of data. And data isn't something just for the data scientists. It's something for everyone. more power we put into everybody's hands. But understanding data is as much about the culture as it is about the technology. You need people with inquisitive minds. Entrepreneurs inside your organization looking for insight, looking for different ways of connecting disparate pieces of data together to drive new value. But then there's some things that we need to do as individuals. And these are things that really limit our capability with technology. There's lots of people talking about mindfulness at the moment, and it kind of fulfills a, fulfills a spectrum. There is the extreme at one end, which is the West Coast definition, West Coast US definition of mindfulness, which is Zen Buddhism and meditation. And I'm not knocking that, that's all great. But I'd like you to consider the British form of mindfulness, which is just pragmatic and common sense. And the British version of, of mindfulness is about making the right decisions with technology. Some of you may experience this. You may be sat in a meeting and either yourself or your colleague has got their laptop open taking notes, also known as catching up on email. If you're in a meeting where that happens, don't have the bloody meeting. Shut the laptop and either continue or forget about the meeting. That's no good. If you're down the pub or in the cafe with your friends and family and you're looking at your Facebook status, don't do that. Be with them. Make a mindful choice about where the technology can help. The successful individuals of the future will be those that understand where technology can help and when it can't. They know when to turn it off and put it away, but equally they know when to pick it up and get engaged. It's a crucial skill that we need to go into. Understand that if you want creativity, you need to create space for that. And you need to create space in two domains. First of all, you need physical space for creativity, so in your office, or at least have a culture that enables people to work from very different locations. So when you need to be creative, make sure that there's somewhere quiet and thoughtful that they can go. But secondly, and this is for all of you, is all of us, is that make sure you have the mental space for creativity. Stop filling every nook and cranny of your time with useless, trivial information. Take some time to step back and think about what is it that you're really trying to solve as an individual, as an organization. You will become more creative just by creating that space. So in summary, I, this is not my future, right? This is not how I see the world playing out. This is not the Terminator, and the internet is not Skynet. I see a very different future. And this is my future. This is a future where human beings are able to stand on the shoulders of digital giants, able to lift up and achieve more because the technology enables us to go further. It reminds me of when I was a kid, when I did my maths O-level, and if you don't know what an O-level is, it's kind of like a GCSE but harder. And uh, it was a point in which in our society we were debating the role of pocket calculators in our children's education because they'd just become affordable and everybody could have a calculator. As a result of that debate, I did my math O level with a logbook and a slide rule. Let me tell you, I'm a better mathematician with a calculator than I am with a tabulated bit of paper and a slidey bit of plastic. Yes, I need to know the basics, but the technology enables me to achieve more. That same debate is no different to what's happening today. When you look at all of the incredible things that technology is bringing to us, our challenge, the challenge I'm laying at your doorstep, is to figure out how do we get the technology in a place that it lifts us and enables us, the human beings, to rise up. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We get the Twitter, Twitter feed if we just can. Um, Dave, just a quick um, supplement, and, and again, I, I, I completely buy the idea of the deluge, completely under, I mean, that, that experience of the office we've all had. The question um, that I think people, a lot of people will have is, this, this how you deal with the deluge, um, it, it's, you're exactly right, data makes sense, and, and, and it makes sense, I think, to have that connectivity. But isn't this something that drives into the hands of big business, like Microsoft? Isn't this something that, at a big level, um, controlling huge amounts of data gives them far more control to big corporations 
or does this scale down? And if so, how does it scale down? I, I mean, I, I absolutely do think this scales down. So yes, companies like Microsoft and Google, uh, Facebook are blessed because we have lots of data. But the reality is, let's, let me take Microsoft's perspective. Microsoft's job is to provide a platform for all of you to build your business. So we have some incredible tools that are available to, uh, to everybody that open up the power of things like machine learning, something that was historically consigned to big organizations. We now have an API, an application program interface, that you can tap into. So, and we also live in a world where the data is increasingly available, whether it's government open data, whether it's the public data we get from Twitter or Facebook. All of that stuff is out there. And the tools are out there from companies like Microsoft. So there's lots of potential. And it's back to what we were talking about, what Ian was talking about earlier when it comes to innovation. Innovation is all about how you rise up to that challenge, how you make the best advantage of all of those things. I don't see data as a big company thing. I actually see something that enables our business and is available to all of us. So I think there's huge opportunity for all sizes of business, not just in terms of the, uh, the data that's available, but increasingly in the tools that are making it accessible. Okay, do we have some quote? Probably got time for a question. Has anyone got anything they want to ask from the audience? There is a mic that will go around. Okay, well that's cool. It is the first one, and yeah, oh, there is one just here. Just grab the microphone. Hello. Um, I, I get everything you're saying. However, I work in a university, and what has happened with the onset of technology is the work has become increasingly difficult, increasingly policed. You have to cover your back every time everyone copies you into six million emails. You can't make any decisions yourself about this. You have to mark online. You're not allowed to mark on paper anymore. That means that you're actually locked into your office for 12 hours a day or something like that. It's, I get everything you say, but the other side is not something that's appeared in what you said. The, the policing of the individual is something I'm very concerned about, and particularly if you're talking about selling data. Yeah, well, there's a couple of levels in what you've said. So, so number one, um, the problem we have in how we use technology today, and your example illustrates this, is that we can have technology, but if we use it with old processes, it doesn't actually work. But I think the point that you're really driving to is around privacy and the value of data and, and all that sort of stuff. So we have to learn some very different lessons about what data means to us. We're going to learn some really different lessons about what privacy means to us as well. And none of this is not, I don't see a world where we give up our privacy either. We actually have to have a very different world that, that enables us to do, do things differently in terms of what we understand the data's for. So we all do this every day. We all have a different definition of privacy, and we'll change that definition based on what service, what value we get from it. And it sounds to me at the moment you've got a bunch of process that actually doesn't deliver any value. And so as a result of that, we can't really see, well, what's the point of doing this, the fact that you have accountability and traceability for, for the marking. In reality, what I'd like to see is a very different approach. So given the, what technology enables, why would you do the process in that way? Why wouldn't you change the process? And this is part of the, the opportunity. And I know it's a bigger, bigger than you or I to, to fix that. But this is what we have to do. Technology is supposed to be a transformational force rather than something that enables us to do the same old stuff just a bit quicker or a bit cheaper. And that's the, really the challenge that we have to get to. But, but Dave, I think the point that's being made there is kind of the point that I was making as well. I think everyone, I, I, I think it's a brilliant summation of where we're at in terms of the deluge. Everyone gets that. But it seems to me there's, a, there's, a, a, there's now a, a, a race on, there's perhaps a war going to happen over how you deal with that. Now, your, your vision of that, I think, is very humanitarian. It's very democratic. It's very much the idea that, theoretically, uh, what we will do is find our own, our own way around this world. The culture, our culture, our behaviors will change. But on the other side of that, I think there's a fear that business, that there's another side, of the controlling side of this, which is, I think, the bit where yeah. the data gets controlled, where big businesses take control. And that's well, the worry I think we have. Well, tr trust is a huge part of this, right? And I, I don't think companies are going to be around, big or small, that abuse the trust of, of data, abuse the trust of their customers. Can I just, can I just add? Um, I'm not just talking about abusing trust. I'm talking about things like you write an email to a student, and then people will say, why did you say that? 
So that means your communication with the student is then policed. If you, if you, um, you get one student complain about something, even if they've never attended any lectures, they pay more attention to them than they do to all the other people who say you're brilliant and you're fantastic because they only look at statistics. Oh, yes, you had so many fours out of four. But an individual complaint is a different matter. Yeah. So it twists and distorts, and it means that you can't give a reference. But, but, but it only twists, like that. But it only twists and distorts because we're, we're using an old culture with a new opportunity. And I think this is the challenge. What you're describing to me is not a technology problem. It's a cultural problem. And, and, and this is you know, I, what I think we face. And, and you know, I'm a technology guy, but I think all of the challenge lies with human beings. You don't solve any of this stuff with having more technology or having less technology. Because if you don't get the culture in the right place, you can't do it. That technology should enable you to work very differently, should enable you to have a much different level of engagement with students that actually is, is Because, remember, we're still the first generation of people to live like this. We don't kind of know what it means. Just because, for example, you know, my theory, whether this is right or not, the people who are for uh, Scotland separating are very active in the digital world. That means they have a louder voice, does it? I mean, it means we see them more, but that, does that mean that they have a louder voice? I and mean, we'll see what happens in the, as how the referendum plays out. But we've got to learn to re-normalize our understanding just because somebody votes on Twitter that they don't like something or co communicates through an email because they don't like it. Well, is that, is that the same? We've seen this with the Press Complaints Commission about advertising because we now have the ability to, to engage lots and lots of people to complain at once. And so the Press Complaints Commission has got to sort of reset its expectations as to, in the past they'd get maybe 15 or 20 complaints. Well, today they can get 20 to 30,000 in an afternoon just because Twitter's been activated in the right kind of way. All of these are cultural problems. And these are things that we've got to learn to understand and get back to, so what is the process here to do? Why do you have a process that says you communicate with your students in that way? And then understand on the basis of why the process exists, could we do it in a different way? Or what's the, the, the impact of having it in that? So I think you know, this is really about culture, and it's about understanding the opportunity that technology provides, as well as the negative impact of how it can be misused. OK, Dave, um, just to so everyone needs to be collecting these words up. Renormalize is my uh, favorite word, Dave. But actually, I think that describes quite brilliantly what you were um, uh, exposing here, which is a disconnect between we have, we've got the technologies to do things. We haven't yet necessarily got the processes and the behaviors to make turn that into something productive. That's exactly right. Yeah. OK, um, so um, that's it. Thanks very much, Thanks, Dave. Mike. Thanks a lot. Thank you. OK, we've heard uh, Twitter uh, mentioned a couple of times already. Um, Twitter must have, I always think, um, as a journalist, if you can get your name known uh, and used regularly as, as a noun, that's great. But if you get a, it to be a verb, then you're really onto a winner. And Twitter's got two, tweet and retweet. I think to turn that into popular imagination tells you the power uh, of, of uh, Twitter. Now, what we've got here with uh, uh, Andy Lickadale, who's actually only just um, recently joined us, he's come from a company called Second Sync, and I think um, who's, that was bought by Twitter a few months back. And I think what he will be able to talk about is something very important, which is the way that, actually, in this case, the world of television, this second screen idea, it's the idea of television, how that interacts with the way we communicate with each other, often at the same time. And those of you with teenage children will know that that's normal. So, uh, Andy Lickadale. Thanks very much. And uh, yeah, it's really nice to be in Cardiff rather than London for a change, um, especially as I live in Chepstow. What's that up there? Cool. Great. So yeah, my name's Andy Littledale. I'm, uh, <clears throat> I have a much less glamorous job title than uh, the previous speaker, uh, Director of Media Analytics. and. Uh, I used to be managing director of a company called Second Sync. And in simple terms, we uh, measured tweets, really. We looked at uh, conversations uh, on Twitter around, specifically around TV. And uh, everything I'm going to talk to you today about kind of revolves around uh, something which is kind of, has been known as social TV. It's a bit of a buzzword. It's a bit like Web 2.0. It kind of gets thrown around a lot 
uh, it means different things to different people. But when I refer to it, it really uh, describes how conversation on Twitter has extended the conversation that had traditionally happened in the living room onto the internet uh, around TV in huge volumes. Um, and Twitter is uh, particularly good at this because uh, three main things. I mean, so Second Sync, we concentrated only on measuring tweets around TV, and that was A, because people tweet when they're engaged with something. So there's a real-time aspect to what's going on. You can look at uh, the peaks of activity around something and map it directly to an event or, or something within the TV show. The second is the fact that it's, it's a public platform. You can actually access this data and do something with it. And the third is that the, the consistent nature of the data, 140 characters or less, means it's really amenable to being made into a metric that can be understood. Um, just to give you a few stats, so in the UK there's uh, 15 million active users of Twitter, and 60% uh, of those uh, we found in our research over the last kind of three years uh, tweet around TV. Um, so you, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real big driver of conversation on, on the platform. Um, and you can think, think of TV shows as kind of mini events in themselves which drive conversations which play out in public. And what we've noticed uh, is that there are kind of three, like, engagement patterns around different TV shows differ massively, but they are consistent. So we see patterns repeating themselves again and again. And these different conversation patterns uh, are really dependent on three main things. One is the genre of the TV show. Uh, the second is the, the demographic of the audience. So, you know, you'll see a, a question type, an older audience uh, reacting quite differently to a, to a younger one. Um, and the time slot as well is something which uh, really affects the, the, the volumes of the tweets which get uh, sent out, but also, um, to, to a different extent, the, the, the kind of quality of them. So I'm just going to show you a, a load of graphs, but they are quite interesting, I promise. Um, so with, um, with uh, dramas, we, uh, uh, we always see a bookend pattern of uh, tweeting. So if you, if you look at the graph here, you can see the actual um, the airing window is in blue at the bottom. And we start tracking tweets half an hour before the TV show starts and finish half an hour after it finishes. Um, and this is just a simple histogram showing tweets over time. So um, you can see there's a huge peak at the beginning and a huge peak at the end. And that is something that we always see with TV dramas. I don't think I've ever seen an episode of a drama which doesn't fit that bookend pattern. Um, and here's another one. You can see the bookend pattern, but you can also see, because it's a commercial channel, there's tweeting going on in the ad breaks as well. Um, and that's completely consistent. Um, Broadchurch is a really ex interesting example, actually, because we saw uh, tweet patterns, well, tw tweet volumes increasing with every episode um, really consistently up until the, the uh, finale of the drama, which got, you know, incredible volumes. And that was matched in the TV you know, uh, ratings as well, which is unusual for a drama. You usually see a drama kind of starting out strongly and then as people kind of fail to commit, uh, you know, to the eight episodes or ten episodes, uh, it slowly drops off. But with Broadchurch, we saw the opposite, that it really drove people uh, to watch the live broadcast. And social media played a, a big part in that, I think. People didn't want spoilers on, on, on Twitter, so they kind of took to the... Example, and they kind of frequently um, display patterns of engagement which repeat themselves uh, almost identically. Um, the, this is the, uh, Taken, the film with Liam Neeson. And if you see that big peak of engagement kind of 20 minutes into the show, um, that's around the segment where he speaks to the kidnappers of his daughter saying, I'll find you and I'll kill you. And if you zoom in on that peak, uh, you will see a predominantly male audience uh, just tweeting those words exactly, I'll find you and I'll kill you, hashtag taken. And that repeats itself time and time and again. If you take a, the same film on a different channel, uh, you can see the patterns are almost identical. Um, and like, likewise, you know, it's, it's, a, um, it's around the same segment. But that's not a uniquely male pattern of behavior. If you take a film like 17 again uh, with Zac Efron, there's a segment kind of 40 minutes into that film, uh, and you can see the peak there, where Zac Efron steps out of a car in slow motion with sunglasses on, and a predominantly female uh, audience tweets, 
I love Zac Efron. And um, and it's it's predictable like clockwork. You can always predict if that t film is in the schedules that 40 minutes into it, Zac Efron will be trending on Twitter in the UK. And so uh, what seems like a kind of uh, a random stream of tweets sometimes when you're looking at your own timeline is actually quite <coughs> fairly predictable and uh, kind of uniform, e even though um, you know the, the films are on different times and the audience is different. Um, Made in Chelsea is kind of the poster child for social TV. It, it, it shows the biggest conversion rate uh, of kind of viewers to tweets. So we regularly see 25% of the audience tweeting around that show. Um, so this one here, we've got uh, it, it actually had tweets from uh, I think it was 120,000 uniques. Um, oh no, here we go, 116. But the the actual TV audience was around 400,000. Consistent across the series, um, and so 25% of the audience are tweeting around that TV show. That's kind of a, at the upper level of what we see. At the, at the lower level is, you know, CBBS, um, which you know gets very very low volumes, if anything at all. And what you do see is people, is parents just saying, "God, I can't believe I'm watching this again." And so but that's the kind of the the kind of the spectrum that we're seeing: zero to 25 percent of the audience are tweeting around TV shows, and that's slowly growing over time. Um, I put this slide in because it kind of demonstrates uh, what a, an individual can do to affect conversation around a particular show. This is uh, Harry Styles tweeting that he's watching The Bachelor on on Channel Five, and this is kind of two years ago when I think he only had about five million followers. Now he's got. 15 million or something like that. Um, but his tweet was retweeted 22,000 times to his 5 million followers. And what we're really interested in is how many of those then went and tuned in so they could share the same TV experience as the person they're following on Twitter. And we've seen a lot of anecdotal evidence that uh, Twitter can drive tuning in this way. Um, so, but it's not just tweets from individuals, it's storylines and, and big volumes which hit people's timelines. Um, and yeah, I mean, I put this in for two reasons. One, it shows that uh, you know large volumes of tweets around TV shows is not uh, confined to you know reality shows and dramas. Um, it it happens around all genres of TV TV programming, including natural history. Um, but also, uh, Red B did a really interesting thing with this. This is something that we uh, we measured when we when I was working at Second Sync and. Red B was doing all the marketing around the Africa series, and they bought the the data off us the morning after it was uh, the first transmission. So the main uh, broadcast went out on Wednesday, and the repeat was on a Sunday. They would take the Twitter data from us first thing on a Thursday morning, and they would look at the peaks of engagement, map those to the sequences uh, in the TV program, and use that to cut the promo uh, that would go out to advertise the repeat on a Sunday, which is something which we you know, never encouraged them to do. They did it off their own back, but it was a really innovative way of looking at data. Um, and if you look at this uh, this episode here, that was that big peak there. I think was the giraffe fight. Um, that huge peak there was the baby elephant dying, which you probably will remember, which is really sad. But each of these other little peaks kind of map to iconic sequences within the Africa series. Um, so you can really see Twitter as a platform. So it, it it plays out. Uh, the volume of tweets to play out over a TV show and like really map to uh, the significant moments in those TV shows. This is an example of how people are tweeting not actually about the TV show so much as the adverts within it. So Channel 4 aired a, a French drama, The Returned, um, but in a bit of really kind of creative programming, they, uh, they dubbed the adverts into French. So the first uh, big peak you see there, 480 tweets per minute, was the first outbreak, which is entirely in French with English subtitles. So you had English, English advert, uh, adverts, but dubbed into French. And then subsequently, the other peaks of the other outbreaks, which were English uh, ads, but with French subtitles. So it was a bit of a gimmick, but it got really got people talking uh, on the internet. And you can see how um, you know the pattern speaks for itself. People are talking about those adverts. Andy. Yeah. Oh, shit. Sorry. Um, so water, this is an example of how we saw like an uplift in viewing figures around like a big event. So 
Uh, it, obviously, it's a, it's a BBC One drama. Um, one of the principal characters was killed off, and we saw an uplift of half a million uh, in the viewing figures uh, around you know, the huge volume of tweets. We can kind of uh, determine that there is a, a relationship between Twitter and TuneIn. Um, this is an example of how uh, broadcasters are kind of getting in on the act and encouraging this behavior of themselves. So, uh, Hugh Ferling Whittingstall saying, uh, encouraging people during an ad break, like just in the lead up to an ad break, to tweet their supermarkets. Um, it was a campaign around sustainable fishing. And uh, you can see it kind of drove huge volumes. And we see more and more of that. So, broadcasters actually tapping into this and um, being proactive in encouraging these conversations. Sport uh, is another really exa good example of something which kind of the events on the pitch play out in real time on Twitter. And so, you know, the big peaks map to big events on the pitch. So a penalty, a goal, uh, a nasty foul, and then the final whistle. Uh, and we see more this more and more in the World Cup as well. Um, we also see uh, a big difference in the Twitter clients that people are using around different TV shows. So for current affairs, uh, so if you look at Newsnight and um, Question Time, You'll always see Twitter.com as the most frequently used uh, Twitter client. For entertainment shows, you'll always see uh, iPhone. And quite often, we see like 60% of tweets around entertainment shows are sent from iPhones. That doesn't, uh, you know, that's that's not necessarily. If you look at the distribution between the handsets of Android and iPhones in the UK market, it's kind of pretty much parity. But around entertainment shows, there's a massive bias towards iPhones. We don't particularly understand why, but it's it's interesting in itself. And I quite often get asked, uh, you know, what what kind of thing, you know, why is it, you know, it's interesting this, but how is it useful? Um, so I just listed some real world examples of people who have used this data in the media. So we've seen it used in, in media planning, people actually, you know, scheduling ad spots based on tweet volumes. We've seen it in commissioning, Shine quite often uses it uh, in their pitches to commissioners, like uh, the fact that different formats are played out differently in social media and using it as, as justification. We've seen it in scheduling, BBC Three, I think, um, took some data from us and used it to inform when a, a TV show actually went out. Um, we see it in new formats, so people are kind of innovating around this new uh, behavior uh, in, in a way which kind of informs how TV is put together. We've seen it in ad targeting, so um, you know, people actually targeting people who are uh, having conversations about a TV show. Um, we've seen it in feedback into live broadcast. We put together um, something for Fremantle which allowed them to feedback straight into X Factor so they could talk about, uh, they could compare tweet volumes of uh, different acts as they kind of played out in real time. So there's, there's lots of things which this data, data can be used for, and it, can, it constantly surprises me uh, that people constantly come out with new, new things to do with it, and new. Um, ways to innovate. Um, so that's it really. I mean that's uh, a brief introduction to social TV and what's going on on Twitter around the TV space. Um, yeah, um, and w first of all thanks. Brilliant. Just really uh, quickly a couple of things that I think are kind of coming out of some of the tweets and by the way uh, as we've got to a deal, let's make sure we are tweeting during, if you've got questions you want to ask. There's a couple of things. One, we talk about using this to innovate, but actually in some ways you could argue that this leads to kind of conservatism because what you're doing, I think a lot of planners and commissioners are looking for things which fit those patterns. So in a way they change the content to try and fit what they imagine the audience is. Is that, is that something which is a concern? Uh, I, I mean, I don't think so. I, mean, I think there's, uh, you know, the, it's not like every format is is building Twitter into it, but a lot of them are. Uh, and in the way it's used, it's used responsibly. But I also think from the advertising side, there's innovation uh, in lots of ways. People are, are are looking at tweet patterns, and they're starting to realise the the value of an engaged audience, particularly when you have a uh, an advertising campaign which is highly integrated into social media with you know hashtag. Is increased inc incrementally, um, so we're seeing lots of like not just in kind of TV formats, but in the way that TV is bought and sold. Uh, you know, lots of innovation is happening in this space. And and the other thing was uh, 
you know, part of the idea, the dream of social media was it was this kind of democratic, you could bypass the, uh, what they used to call the gatekeepers. But in some ways, um, what we're seeing from the patterns you're looking at here is it kind of amplifies the already existing big, big noises. So Harry Styles or whoever else. I wonder how much this is celebrity driven or even brand driven um, rather than it coming from people's behavior that pre-existed. I think it's mostly coming up, um, you know, not from individuals and brands, but from the, you know, from the audience itself. And that's what makes it really, really interesting. You know, if you look at question time, you'll quite often get, you know, 50,000, 100,000 tweets around uh, what is essentially, a, you know, a political program. And, 